Hello, my name is Catherine Platt and I'm the director of the Hong Kong International Literary Festival. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the festival today. It's the fourth day of our 21st um, edition, which is um, the Rebound edition. And um, over these 10 days, we have more than 70 events taking place, both online and in person. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance yet, please go to our website, uh, festival.org.hk, and take a look at the full range of programs. Um, as uh, the first few days, most things are online, but then starting on Thursday, um, we have a weekend of more than 50 events that you can attend in person if you're here in Hong Kong at Asia Society, the Fringe Club and Tycoon. And we're starting off on Thursday night with the 2021 Booker Prize winner, Damon Galgut, who will be speaking from London. And that's on Thursday night at Asia Society. But first of all, tonight, um, I'm very excited to welcome a panel of speakers who are joining us from the UK and the United States, um, Kate Lister, Tanea Narendra, and Sarah Chadwick. And they will be speaking about the history and current reality of attitudes and beliefs around sexual health. In just a minute, I'm gonna hand over to Valentin Sommer, who will introduce the panel um, and bring them all on. Just a couple of points. If you're here for the first time on Crowdcast, um, you can see the comments down the right-hand side. If you have a question for the speakers, if you click on ask a question down in the right there and a box opens up, you can put the questions in there and um, the panel will get to those a bit later in the hour. You can also click on the green button at the bottom of the screen and that will, um, connect you through uh, to where you can buy the speaker's books online. So this event will stay on Crowdcast until the end of November uh, to watch on demand and we will be adding Chinese subtitles to most events, although not absolutely all of them, but I hope we will do that for this one. So just finally, I want to thank all of our cultural partners, our sponsors and donors for their generous support and in particular um, an ongoing grant from the Standing Committee on Language, Education and Research. So now I'd like to welcome Valentine to join me. Um, Valentine is an intimacy coach based in Brooklyn, NYC. He uses insights and techniques from mindfulness, neo-tantra and inner parts work to help his clients get in touch with their desires and get clarity on how to get there and cultivate a gen gentle acceptance of who they are and where they are at. Um, and you can find him online at Awake and Sexy if you want to find out more, which I'm sure you will after this conversation. So welcome, Valentin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. And we have an amazing panel today, and we're going to talk about the curious histories and current reality of sexuality and sexual health. So let's start right away with uh, our speakers, and I'll start with Sarah Chadwick. Um, so let me introduce her as she joins. Uh, hi, Sarah. Um, you are a guest researcher at Chicago's Loyola University with your life between the US and the UK. You're passionate about sex equality, gender studies, humor and learning. And your book, The Sweetness of Venus, the cover of which I see behind you, uh, is a provocative, straight-talking, rigorous, rigorously researched history of the clitoris. It explores the history of perceptions about female anatomy, the impact of knowledge and philosophy, uh, and the contribution of psychology and evolutionary theory to challenge Western culture's definition of female sexuality. And I don't know if you're aware, but you, apparently, according to the internet, you've been described as an articulate and complex spokeswoman for a new generation of women, commended for your exceptional research, kindness, and candor. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Um, anything you want to add? Anything you want to add on to that before I introduce our next speaker as well? No, I love that introduction. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for being here and being with us today. Um, we also have Dr. Kate Easter with us today, um, who is a lecturer at the School of Arts and Communication at Leeds Trinity University. Um, welcome, Kate. Hi. Us from the UK. So. Kate, your primary research interest is on the history of sexuality with a particular focus on the figure of the sex worker. Yes. You currently work with several charities, women's rights organizations, and campaign groups where you use historical research to contextualize the current debates around sex work. You're also the curator of the online research project, Ors of Four, which is sex positive, interdisciplinary, 
a research project and archive dedicated to exploring the history of human sexuality and challenging shame and stigma, which is, I don't know that's needed. <laughs> and you're also the author of Q's History of Sex, which is a fascinating book peppered with surprising and informative historical slang, illustrated with eye-opening, toe-curling, and meticulously sourced images from the past. And thank you, Sarah, so sorry for us the cover of that book. And I think the, the excerpt says, you will laugh, you will wince, and you will wonder just how much has actually changed. And like me, as you read the book, you'll be grateful that at least some of it did. <laughs> thank you, Kate. <laughs> welcome for- oh, thank you. Welcome here. Is there anything you'd like to add to, to this? Just thank you so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's great to, to be with the speakers today and to be part of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I'm going to try introducing our last speaker and we'll see if he's able to join because I know we had some technical difficulties here. But Dr. Tenaya Marandra, Dr. Tenaya is a medical doctor. Uh, she's an award-winning, intentionally trained medical doctor, embryologist, and scientist who's passionate about, passionate about medical education. Uh, she studied for a master's at the University of Oxford and she's a doctor in England and she's committed to making public medical education her life goal. She's a medical doctor, but she's also a millennial doctor. She's registered on Instagram where she has above half a million followers, I think 544,000 out of this morning, uh, and where her no-nonsense, jargon-free approach to really anything sexual and sexual health related from contraception to UTI to periods and pleasure, and talking about things, topics like BDSM, uh, makes her account maybe the biggest one on sexual health on Instagram. I couldn't find any that had a on those topics that had a bigger following, and so as far to the extent of my knowledge, that might actually be the biggest one. And I don't remember if I said that, but she spent her time between India and the UK. Um, she also was awarded the Influencer of the Year Award in 2020 by SH24, the online sexual health partner of the NHS in the UK. And she's currently writing a book on sex ed for everyone. So it seems that we might still be having some technical difficulties. So from now on, I'm going to assume, yeah, also I see in the chat that we have some technical issues. So we will start uh, without Tenaya, and hopefully she's going to be able to pop in at some point. All right. So Kate and Sarah, welcome again. Oh, Tenaya is in the chat. So I'll, I'll, I'll what I'll do in in case uh, you're not able to join tonight, I'll monitor the chat regularly. And if I see you write something, I'll try to comment on it. And Sarah and Kate, feel free to bring my attention there if you don't, if you notice I don't see it. Um, and let's start with the historical representation of the clitoris. So when you Google clitoris, the first answer that comes up is a small, sensitive, erectile part of the female genitals at the interior source end of the vulva. And the source for that is the Oxford language. So both on the clitoris itself and on its history, there's a lot more under the hood than it seems. Uh, as some of the viewers may or may not know, it's the one organ in the human body that is entire, only geared toward pleasure, and it's actually a lot bigger than the part that we see. Historically, this part was not always acknowledged. As you get uh, talk about at various times, it's always been either completely ignored or actively repressed and mutilated. It came on being rediscovered by men that were Christopher Columbus discovered America, discovered, and through the beliefs and representations around that part of the female anatomy can often be seen beliefs and perspective and opinions about female sexuality in general. Um, so Sarah, your book is centered around the history of the clitoris. Uh, so would you like to start and maybe give the broad strikes of both 5,000 years of history in, in, in a few minutes? <laughs> first to start. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think for, for me the really big surprise when I started delving into this topic and beginning to realise that there was a whole book to be written on it is that amongst the dominant thinkers in the West for such a long time they didn't really believe that the clitoris was a feature of normal women. 
um, and and this model that they had of the female body that it was an inside out version of the male body actually entirely marginalized the clitoris and and Kate I know you write about this in your chapter too that although there were I think I mean and clearly women and men <laughs> knew that it existed but but although there were people who, who who were acknowledging the clitoris it's really what the dominant thought was and the dominant thought was that it was was an, an anomaly and and in fact that's where the title of my book comes because in 1559 Rialdo Colombo discovered the clitoris and said if it could be given a name uh, it should be called the love or sweetness of Venus but you know, ironically, 10 years later, he was absolutely silenced by the dominant thinker of the day who said it's not a feature of normal women, that it, he called it some sport of nature. Um, and, and in fact, as part of my research, I looked at current sex ed books in America for young teens and the book targeted at boys didn't mention the clitoris and the book targeted at girls uh, showed it as a small dot on a diagram and said that it was responsible for tingly feelings and the, the word orgasm does not exist in the book at all so so i think it's even something we're up against today and and yet this is the full structure of the clitoris you know it's not external it it's stretches with inside the pelvic cavity uh, and is responsible for female sexual desire Pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. Kate, anything you want to add to that? Wow. Um, well, I mean, Sarah wrote the book quite literally, um, and a fantastic book it is too. I, I think the thing that interests me about the clitoris is, is it kind of <laughs> there's like ongoing jokes about how the how no one can ever find the clitoris, how men can never find the clitoris, and <laughs> it's like it's bizarrely true throughout history as well is like you know you you go looking for it and there are there are fleeting references to it here or there and as sarah was saying they're mostly tied up with this idea that it's is, is if it's not something that shouldn't be there it's something that's very dangerous and that needs to be controlled and uh, you need to keep an eye on it it's almost like this kind of like grumbling appendix type of thing do you mean like at any moment it could turn women into deranged lesbians or there's lots of references going right back to the ancient world where they're, they're basically um uh, likening it to a penis which i suppose is the underlying i don't know what you think about that sarah it's the underlying fear that it is a penis that it could and that it will masculinize women and you get this kind of fear i mean some of the earliest references to it in western writing are references to it being cut out to it being um to, to the clitoris being cut away uh, quite appalling wince inducing medical descriptions of what you do with an oversized clitoris so it is much abused much maligned much misunderstood it comes to be the kind of focal point of uh, a lot of um, almost everything that's feared about female sexuality um as you were saying in the beginning it's only pleasure is to bring it's only function is to bring pleasure and i think that's probably that's it's uh, that's it's it's curse and it's and it's most amazing thing at the same time because i think that kind of what underpins a lot of this is that you don't need a penis to operate it <laughs> yeah and so as you both as you both mentioned sorry please no, I was just going to say, I think there's this incredible mismatch and acceptance between the penis as, as an organ of sexual desire and pleasure. And, and yet if women have something approaching that, uh, the incredible threat that that brings and, and the idea that a, sexual, a woman with sexual agency will bring disruption and chaos to society. And, and I think there's through we have this complete mismatch in in kind of e equality and attitudes towards which is why female sexuality it still makes people anxious i think yeah and as you as you both alluded there's this in idea to our history of history and maybe still in our current perceptions of seeing the female sexual organs as really the reverse of of the penis right even though Kate, in your book, you talk about the words uh, for for vagina coming from uh, she 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 the word in English. Yeah, right. uh, the word the vagina sword, sword. Is, is yeah, it's Latin. It means sheath. It means something that holds a sword. That's its meaning. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 
And Sarah, in your book, you have all depictions of what people thought the inside of the vagina might look like, and it's really just us in reverse. Uh, and yet at the same time, so we know, thanks to current anatomical knowledge, that the erectile tissue in the clitoris is really the equivalent of the penis uh, in the uh, male body. So there is uh, <laughs> definitely a parallel, but it's just not the one that people thought about. And you can see that both penis obsession and fear in the way that in your book, Kate, you talk about how people thought that a bigger clitoris meant that you would go toward lesbianism, which was a terrible crime and, and, and perversity in, in, in those medical, in the medical perception of those times. And, and, and it's fascinating, right? If you think about it, you're saying that women who would like other women do it because they look like men. <laughs> like th there's yeah. just such a, a, a fear that people might be attracted to anything else. <laughs> out of that. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not so much the fear of like lesbianism as we would understand it today. I don't think because I'm not sure that the people in the past like like today you'd say I'm a lesbian and we all know what that means. If you said that in the 16th century, they they would be more confused about what that means. Although obviously same sex desire has always existed, but it's more the fear that you were becoming like a man. I think is is kind of what underpins it is that, that an oversized clitoris would be like a penis and then a woman who wanted to have sex with another woman was being like a man and it's this kind of like usurpation thing that that underpins all of it all the way through and yeah is I mean it's not just the clitoris the entire vulva the whole kit and caboodle has, has been viewed throughout most of history as a kind of either an absence either it's just a nothingness is there or um or as an inverted penis and I think I think that 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 entire area, in fact, you could extend it to female sexual pleasure, has been viewed through the male gaze almost exclusively, like to the point mm -hmm. where you can't conceive of it as being an organ of its own. It has to be an inversion of what I've got, <laughs> you know? Yep. And so Tenea to join us. Welcome, Tenea. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I was having some Thank technical difficulties. No worries. <laughs> uh, so could you hear us the entire time? Yeah, yeah, I was all through. I was oh, here all through. Amazing. So, so welcome. Is there anything you'd like to add about yourself first, and <laughs> and then would you like to contribute to this conversation? Um. Yeah. So you've given a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much for that. But I just want to jump on and add the fact that uh, I find it very interesting in the way the subject of female sexuality and the genitals and the anatomy has been treated like culturally in different parts of the world. For example, in India, in the Kama Sutra, um, we have a word for the clitoris, which is called Madan Chhatri. Madan means pleasure and Chhatri means umbrella. So it's literally the pleasure umbrella. And because it's covered with a hood, they have this cute little umbrella metaphor going there, which is so wonderful. Um, there's not a lot of reference to it, but there is an understanding that, that there is something called a Madan Chhatri or a pleasure umbre umbrella that you can focus on. And there's a lot of focus on oral sex and, you know, stimulating um, the clitoris sexually instead of just focusing on penetration, which I think is a very curious insight if you compare with how we've seen it treated in the other half of the world. Yeah. And Sarah, please. Oh, so I found it really interesting that the Victorians translated the Kama Sutra and in doing so erased many of the references to female sexual agency and pleasure and, and that that Victorian translation has become the dominant text that, that we are often still reading and uh, I just think that's incredibly, incredibly telling. It is a very exoticized and fetish um sort of selling or retelling of uh, the classical texts. Yeah. And what you just mentioned, Tene, I really show the contrast is uh, historical uh, representations and judgments around some sexual practices. Uh, in Kate's book, I think uh, you mentioned, Kate, you mentioned that in some period of history, telling a man that he would go down on a woman would be a terrible <laughs> insult. <laughs> Yes. Do you know what? And I think that that's only just shifting now. There's a palpable, noticeable shift that it's no longer seen as something that... Because um, there was that debate, wasn't there? That, that kind of furore that kicked off. Was it DJ Khalid? 
who just a couple of years ago said that he would never go down on a woman because um, he was the man and that he would get oral sex, but he was like the big guy. And and what was what was what was interesting about that wasn't so much that people are still walking around thinking this stuff because whatevs. But it was more that there was this big backlash about it online on social media, including like like um, Dwayne the Rock Johnson came out and and he was like, "Look, I'm just saying that I bring my A game in the bedroom all the time." And there's been this kind of just this shift of like noticing that if you're not prepared to do that, it just kind of means that you're that you're crap in bed. Oh yeah, Harry Styles, yes, with his watermelon smile. Um, there's there's been a, a definite shift, I think, anyway, in this kind of. That it's no longer enough to just kind of think that that the penis is going to do it and and long live this attitude. But certainly, all throughout history, there's been this kind of, especially if you look at like I mean, in ancient Rome, I think Sarah will be able to tell me a bit more about this one. But the the word for the clitoris was obscene. Was it was it Ladica or Landica? And it was considered like like a really if like dropping the C bomb today would be, and it was an insult to say yeah. that you would go down on a woman. It was like it was like considered quite weak and emasculating and effeminate because only lesbians and men without a penis that worked would do that. I think that's where it comes from. It's this this fear of emasculation. And now there's been a very nice shift led by Harry Styles, thank you, <laughs> and others. But this idea that, <laughs> that that it's not emasculating, it's really good. Please do more of it. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. So I'll, I forget to say that at the beginning, I think Catherine might have mentioned it. If people in the audience have questions, you're welcome to ask them in the chat and I'll leave some time at the end to try to answer them. So if you have any questions for our presenters, feel free to write them down. Um, and Tenaya, what about current, so you, you were experienced with the world of medicine and sexual health in both India and the UK. What are the cultural differences you observe today on um, perception of the clitoris, for instance? Um, the clitoris is not a conversation we've started to have enough in India, to be very honest. It's only now that we actually have a big um, surge in sex positive influencers coming on board. So it's been, people are definitely talking about it more, but I don't think we are in a stage where we are really having a conversation about it to comment on it, how it's different. In the UK, at least I understand, say for example, something as simple as Cards Against Humanity. There is a card about the clitoris in, you know, that game. Um, I don't think you you walk up to a random person on the street here, or say a well-versed person who reads, let's say, Western literature and stuff like that. They might not know about the clitoris, really. And I find that very interesting, particularly in the medical context, because we have so much labiaplasty and so much, you know, cosmetic surgery happening in India at the moment in the genitals. And even the doctors are not very well aware about the clitoris. And I can blame our books for that. Uh, my my this fat gynecology textbook has this much of a section on the clitoris so we don't understand um or we're not taught about it in medical schools or even outside of that you know sex doctor is just such a taboo thing <laughs> that i feel like we have a long long way for that conversation to come back which is very sad considering our history i hear that okay and sarah anything you want to add on that topic all right, so the clitoris, as we've mentioned at the beginning, is an organ responsible for pleasure. And as Tanea just said, often when we talk about anatomy, when you talk about um, sexual health in general, pleasure is a very taboo topic. And so the conversation has a long way to go on that. The clitoris, though, as the only organ to get solely to our pleasure, is also, also has a huge role, as we know today, in the orgasm for anyone, for all the vulva owners out there. Uh, and we know actually today that for the immense majority of women, uh, reaching an orgasm requires at least some form of clitoral stimulation. Dr. Tenaya, in an informal poll of your followers on, on Instagram, 80%, 18% uh, vulva owners only were orga able to orgasm from natural life activities and the other 82% from clitoris stuff, as you write. And even when we do like slightly more nuanced uh, surveys of what we can do on Instagram and trying to also control for independently clitoral stimulation only, penetration only, a mix of both. Um, Dr. Lori Mintz, who also has a great book on the clitoris, uh, wrote in, in a survey on her 
students, she found out that only 4% of women were describing penetration alone as the most reliable way to orgasm, which means that for 95% of them, uh, the some form of clitoral stimulation was necessary. And so this is the norm statistically. And yet, yet the common belief, the common perception is still that there is two kinds of orgasms out there, the vaginal clitoral orgasms, and that one is somehow better, deeper, more mature, you name it, uh, than, than the other. And often that's thought about as the vagina, vaginal orgasm that requires penetration intercourse and is a very heteronormative, heteronormative version of sex. So Sarah and Kate, you both write in your books about uh, the history of that construction of, of school of thought. Uh, and some of the usual suspects are the church, agriculture, fraud. Um, Kate, would you like to start elaborating on that? Um, yeah, I'll do what I can. Um, but <laughs> I feel still... like I'm throwing you under the bus every time. <laughs> no, that's no, bring it on. Um, so we still have this kind of idea that that's still with us that you have vaginal orgasms and you have clitoral orgasms. You still hear people talking about it in those terms, and it's only within the last. 20 years or so that what we've realized is that the really they're all clitoral orgasms really is is what they are is because um if you achieve orgasm through penetration the clitoral roots extend behind, down the anterior vaginal wall so it's it's really all clitoral stimulation but that isn't how it's been understood throughout most of history um and there is a, along with the kind of demonization of the clitoris which kind of pushes people to more towards penetrative heteronormative sex doesn't it let's see that that's who that one's benefiting but this idea that clitoral orgasms are bad it um it has it, it goes way back you can trace it but it really got going into the early 20th century with the, the likes of freud and people like that and he wrote quite extensively about how a clitoral orgasm is sexually immature and that only a vaginal orgasm is is the mark of a woman who's who's officially not frigid and is um sexually mature and and he wasn't the only one there's loads of people saying it. it's complete cobblers but it was it was really quite damaging um and it's still with us today this idea that you are that you have somehow failed if you can't come through through penetration and it's complete nonsense that's my TED talk anyway. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I mean, think Freud, and he was writing in, in 1933. I mean, that's, that's not a hundred years ago. So is it any wonder that our great grandparents, our grandparents and, and grandmothers were not comfortable talking about female pleasure and desire? And, and I mean, Freud wrote, the elimination of clitoral sexuality is a precondition for the development of femininity. So actually, if you, if you were not able to experience an orgasm, uh, without clitoral stimulation, you were you were pathologized. There was something you were sexually inadequate, and and this idea is still was being played out in some of the kind of sex ed sex writing books throughout the nineteen sixties, the nineteen seventies, and you know sheer height really tried to put the clitoris on the map by asking over 3,000 women uh, about their kind of lived sexual experiences. Her report was branded branded by Playboy the hate report um, and and actually that this resistance to the idea that, that penetrative uh, heteronormative sex might not be uh, uh, orgasmic for most women, there's just enormous resistance to it. Yeah, and often what we see, in fact, so I know from feedback both of you received on your books, and I'm and I'd be curious to hear what Tenaya uh, is hearing through her own work. Uh, a lot of women, when they find out about this research, about those facts, through those actual, actually properly researched material, uh, real, come to you and say, oh my God, I thought it was me. I thought I was broken. I thought I had those issues, and I'm learning that this is normal. So I'm wondering if anyone of you would like to talk about that. Tanaya? Um, it's something I actually experienced myself because I, for the longest time, I think I was 24 when I realized that 
okay it's fine and that was just 4 years ago for me and like now i'm on my way to talking about sex all day long for somebody who comes from you know a medical background <laughs> even i didn't know that it was very strange and so many people come with this exact same idea that i was broken i thought i was alone i thought i was the only one sir so, get is anything like that to that I'll just say that whenever someone brings up the subject of Freud, I could honestly, I could slap him. I really could. I mean, you know, he did, he did a lot of good stuff, didn't he? But it's this one in particular, and it had real repercussions. You know, there was um, one of his devoted followers, um, it was Marie Bonaparte, great niece of Bonaparte himself. She had multiple surgeries to have her clitoris cut off and repositioned near her vaginal opening in the hopes of achieving this much mythologized. vaginal orgasm um, and she never got it she just mutilated herself but the, the repercussions of this stuff and it's still um there are still some uh, neo tantra groups that teach that clitoral orgasms are bad and that you should go for the, the the vaginal orgasm so it's still we're still kind of in this this mix of it today i think it's not dead history not at all yeah sorry is there anything else you want to add I was saying I think the media plays a huge part in that in that that actually the kind of you know the 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 hands hands free orgasmic experiences that women exp- in so many kind of tv it's a kind of four thrusts and done kind of um model and I, i mean it is incredibly encouraging that there are increasingly shows that that begin to to show a much more realistic portrayal of pleasure but um it it is still the kind of it, it's the shorthand it's the dominant model that we see around us and research shows that women who are comfortable using the word clitoris are much more likely to be experiencing orgasm in their own lives and and it and yet i mean kate you talked at the beginning about the c word and you know i think maybe clitoris is the c word uh, you know you you can't say it on instagram um i certainly mm-hmm. can't advertise my book on instagram or facebook because of of the c the c word on it it, it still creates huge anxiety so if we're not talking about it we're not telling women about it we're not allowed to say it absolutely i mean how can you talk about pleasure if if you can't even use the words Do you know i mean that it's it's a real sensorious thing as if you if if the only sex we can talk about in a public arena is functional reproductive sex and the rest is considered obscene then we never we then we're really struggling aren't we you know i mean we still at the age of trying to battle abstinence only sex ed so pleasure inclusive sex ed is like so far away right now that um it's ridiculous and we we really yeah, need it we need oh, is he coming back no kids please no i was going to say we really need it we need pleasure based education we need consent based education and we need porn education as well i'd put all of those things on the curriculum because um we have never had more accessibility to pornography we like really extreme hardcore pornography but what we don't have is education around that which that that shows you that pornography isn't real sex like even even the people in that those scenes aren't actually having sex like that like if you panned back you'd see all the people stood around with cameras and booms and somebody eating a sandwich and like the director shouting cut and but we don't teach people that so like when women are orgasming in porn it's like this massive trivia fountain squirting thing and it's just that's just not we need to be teaching people it's not real that that's that's yeah i'm quite passionate about that but we're a long way off that because we're still in functional sex education aren't we are you familiar with uh Cindy Gallup's project make love not porn which, which i mean is is a they is is a fabulous project that invites people to to send in uh real videos of of their lived sexual experiences and yet she has really struggled to to find funding for that as a project and and yet you know Pornhub is part of one of the top four data streaming companies in the world and and there is no shortage of funding for those projects but but women looking to create um documentaries or porn sites that focus on female pleasure really struggle to get backing or 
Um, there's a fabulous film, The Dilemma of Desire by uh, Maria Finizio, who, who is a highly acclaimed documentary writer. And yet she had to self-fund. It's a really exquisitely beautiful film film. She had to self-fund it and she really struggled to sell it into any of the big streaming sites. Uh, and it, it got even more perverse coming back to what you said, Kate, on educating people about porn. Proper sex education is lacking so much that a lot of people think they're get, are getting the closest thing to sex education through porn, which then has the impact of, because people don't have the critical distance to realize that what we're seeing is not necessarily realistic, that we're, what they're seeing is not necessarily the norm in any way, shape or form. So some people might really enjoy those sexual practices in the bedroom. Uh, yeah, like it distorts uh, all perception about what sexuality should be. And it's not surprising with the lack of education. Uh, in the US, for instance, where uh, Sarah and I are based, not even every state is required to have medically accurate sexual education. So even staying in the functional realm, even before talking about pleasure, we don't even have that part yet. Uh, but things change. Even <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, please, Tanea. Um, even outside of porn, say in popular depictions of very sexually liberated shows, for example, Sex in the City was quite revolutionary in the way it very frankly talked about women owning, owning their sexuality and just going out about town and doing their own thing. But even there, there was this very strict narrative of penetration leads to orgasm because it was all, it would always be one of the lead characters lying in bed with their hands like this and first trust and done, like Sarah says. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny to see the the baby evolution. We we see something changing, like oh, this is great, and then we realize, yeah, but you could have gone that far. <laughs> you could have you could have gone the extra mile, maybe. And I think I think tonight in one interview I read about you online, you mentioned Bridgerton, and there's a one sex scene in it where there's actually foreplay in it, really pictured as part of something that brings up pleasure. And I remember seeing that I was like, oh wow, this is really cool, like something more realistic. But then the backlash online was like. Does, does, does the Jew really minutes of four plays now? <laughs> All right, I'll move on to another topic then, and then, then maybe we'll move on to the questions. Another um, historical reality of, around sexuality in general is that of sex work. Um, and it seems to have been around for quite some time, even though, uh, Kate, in your book, you make the point that Sex work might not be the oldest profession, that might be closer to medicine, but definitely seems to be about as old as the apparition of money. And you even mentioned an uh, interesting experiment with monkeys, with the, well, the second they start having some form of currency, apparently some of them start trading it for, for sex, which I thought was really interesting. And I'm all, my scientific background is like, saying like okay, you know, what are all the ways in which the scientists might have unconsciously frame that <laughs> for it to happen. So I would love to, to hear more about that. But so around sex work, the one thing that has been quite different, even though sex work seems to have been pretty much always present for recorded history, regulation and the view of sex work has changed quite a bit. And though there is a debate on whether it was ever seen as sacred, there are definitely periods where it was recognized, regulated, taxed, um, and seen as part of that of the social offering and activities in, in a city. So I'm wondering if, maybe starting with you, Kate, if you'd like to comment on how today's perceptions and regulations around sex work uh, relate to what we've seen in different parts of history and what we can learn from that. Um, yeah, so uh, it might not be the oldest profession, but I think that sex is definitely one of the oldest currencies definitely it has an intrinsic value right and just because because if you, you take cultures that don't didn't have money and didn't have jobs it's it can't be a job can it but um it it can certainly be traded for things it's definitely as old as as money um but all throughout history we've kind of it's strange it's like you can trace it back to you know ancient assyrian babylonia the oldest records we got it um of it uh, i think they're 1800 bc so we're four thousand years into this and we're kind of still having the same debates which is that the authorities 
get nervous, panic, and then try and work out how they're going to control this. And they deploy numerous measures, which is um, can be imprisonment, punishment, <clears throat> um, really awful things like death, mutilation, excommunication. But then, um, then there's uneasy periods of tolerance where the zoning is deployed. So various cities and states will say, well, all right, you can do it, but you can only do it over here. Um, and that's not particularly helpful to the, the mostly women selling it because that's still the state saying where, when and how. Um, and there's there's also sort of systems of regulation, which again don't really benefit the women themselves. Like France had a system of regulation since Napoleon, which was forced registration of forced vaginal examinations to try and get clean bills of health. So I think all throughout history, women have borne the brunt of this, which is an interesting one anyway, because there's plenty of men that sell sex. And there's, the, there's women that buy sex, but they kind of get written out of this all throughout history. And it's very much focused on on women who are doing it. Um, and I think that the, the sort of the message that you can take away from history is that we have to stop punishing the people selling sex punitively. And for the and we're in a really exciting period in history now, which is that because sex workers have been able to organise, they're able to have their own voices, they've got their own representation. Um, there's all kinds of sex worker rights movements all over the globe, and they're able to fight for what they want and ask for what they want now instead of people being talking over them or pushing them to the sidelines. So I think that's a really interesting stage for us is that we can now we should be speaking to sex workers directly. Um, but I've always I'm fascinated by the, the history of sex work because I think that it tells it says a lot about how a culture views women, money and sex is how they respond to the to the women selling sex. And you get this real state of cognitive dissidence, which is that at one point, on one hand, they're desired and they're wanted. But on the other hand, they're kind of hated because they're desired and they're wanted and stigma. And we still live with stigma. So I think that's what we need to do is we need to work towards destigmatizing it and giving rights and safety and protection to the people that, that sell sex that's yeah it's been a long time coming it's ironic isn't it in cultures that thrive in in other economic models on supply and mm. demand that actually within the area of sex work that actually the issue still focuses on supply rather than acknowledging the demand it's that that is true that is true and all the way throughout history it's been um the the people selling that have attracted the most criticism and the most punishment uh, if you look at like the systems of forced registration of vaginal examination in the 19th century in britain and france and various other places no one was checking the people buying it to see <laughs> to see if they had any diseases so it was almost an entirely useless system but um but yeah i think that what we need to do is move away from the stigmatizing of it which also requires dismantling a lot of the things we've been talking about already which is sex in general about it being dirty and shameful and nasty because when you stigmatize a group of people violence is easier to enable against them that's the, that's ultimately what happens so that's what we need to to do and to move forward with doing yeah it's it's very interesting because in most countries where sex work is illegal if there is, say, a police raid or something of that sort, um, the people that are arrested are the sex workers and not the ones who are buying it. They have absolutely no responsibilities and are completely absorbed right. of everything right away. Yeah. Yeah. And even in, in countries like, like Britain, where we've got legalization, which is that it's legal, but only in certain ways in certain times. And that's a model that they've got in Germany and various other places is it, it's it's again, it's always focused on the person selling sex and they're the ones that disadvantages them and if you criminalized any aspect of it it's harder for people to report crimes because they've already been criminalized you know if you're already doing something that's going to get you in trouble with the police why would you report violence you know but yeah so i've monopolized this bit of the conversation i do apologize but but yeah i do feel quite passionate that people selling sex should be kept safe and have rights Yeah, and be heard and have a voice and be involved and be heard and in have conversations a around regulation. Yeah. And, and have a place the, at the table. In the U.S. Mm -hmm. Like in the U.S. right now, uh, there is a recently a new regulation passed, like CISTA, CISTA I don't know, we remember the letters, CISTA for stuff, I think, something mm -hmm. like this. And the intent, the uh, announced intent of the that regulation is to uh, combat, uh, fight sex trafficking. However, in, in practice, 
it's pushing out all the sex workers from advertising online. This whole thing, uh, like whomever has the server, the physical servers, uh, and sex workers are saying, this is not going to help us. This is going to push us back on the street. This is push us back to our unsafe condition. Uh, yeah, so having a voice and being heard. So unless one of you three wants to add something on that topic, I'm going to move to the chat and check on the questions that we might have. I think we had a couple. Um, so first question is to Kate. Um, I have read your book yet, but will do soon. Of course, there's a lot of negative perceptions toward the clitoris and clitoral orgasms. But were there any positive examples you've come across in your research, either culturally or any interesting anecdotes? Um, so one of the things that's always interesting to look at is you've got to be careful as a historian is what sources you are using because they'll always skew the data. So if you're looking at the Victorians, for example, and you're reading only medical texts where you've got maniacs cutting out the clitoris and all kind of institutionalizing women because they have a clitoris, except you'd be forgiven for thinking the Victorians just absolutely hated clitorises. But then if you look at Victorian pornography, of which there was lots and lots of written pornography, they're not slagging off the clitoris. They are very, very pro-clitoris. They know exactly what it is. They know exactly how to pleasure it. And so all of these things. So there are positive representations, and you tend to find that in the erotica. If I could jump in and add, add to that, I, I found that actually it's 1671 Jane Sharp, who was a midwife. And actually, it's again, if you, if you move away from the dominant and mainstream academic works into what gets called kind of vernacular culture, there is a real emphasis on female desire and pleasure and mutuality. And, and Jane Sharp in her midwife's handbook is, is very clear. And I think she went under the radar because, of course, she was a midwife dealing with women's work in a women's arena. Um, and, and also I found about Aristotle's masterpiece in the 1700s and it was it was a cheap tittle tattle book that was kind of probably black market, furtively sold. It was reprinted many, many times. And, and although it's full of uh, very funny now, what we see is very funny inaccuracies. There is also a lot in there about about female desire and pleasure and the importance of mutuality. So so it's this split, I think, between the dominant academic culture um and 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 of course people were having some people many people let's hope were having pleasure underneath can i is there anything you want to comment as well um i'm actually trying to remember there's a tradition in uh, urdu literature called rexi i don't know too much about it so i won't tattle on but um a lot of it is where women write books or pamphlets where they, they can discuss ways to pleasure yourself as sort of like a you know this is a to do from your sister kind of situation um in a very sisterly fashion they share tips they share um details of what the anatomy is like and they share how you can incorporate this in your sex life without alarming anybody <laughs> yeah. thank you so next question uh, someone say they're listening like <laughs> with a little emoji in the chat. Uh, based on what Sarah said about orgasm being clitoral as a many way, does this small thing as a case for phasing out the phrase vaginal orgasm? I mean, I think all of us would agree that actually it now is a completely spurious and, and defunct notion that actually female pleasure is experienced through the structure of the clitoris within the pelvic cavity. And, and if we all understood the full structure of the clitoris as kind of existing internally within women's bodies. Uh, one of my favorite facts is that during arousal, it fills with four to 11 times its blood flow, whereas the vagina fills with three to four. And, you know, the clitoris is, is the powerhouse for female orgasm and and its position within the pelvic cavity will be as varied as breast size and shape penis size and shape and and if the confluence of the bulbs and the cura uh, create a what makes up part of the g-spot or or, or is structured in such a way that penetration is, is orgasmic that's one one route but but for the majority of women that's not the case and and yes i think orgasm is orgasm however it is achieved and um and and if, in fact there's incredible research on on the way that actually 
um, some women experience orgasm through other stimulation of other parts of the bodies. So, so we definitely need to move away from the insistence that that pleasure requires uh, a vagina. And it and it becomes a much more inclusive model of what sex is then too. In case do you want to comment on that? I, I just agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, I think as long as we're talking yeah. about vaginal orgasms and clitoral orgasms, we're just we're not really doing ourselves any favors. You know, yeah. it's it's yeah, it's I can't. It, what would it be like? It'd be like describing orgasms as with penises as hand orgasms and inside orgasms. <laughs> to me, it's just like it's it's when you actually break it down, it doesn't mean anything, yeah. and it and it kind of it reproduces this idea that there's and and also it kind of it, it's it's not accurate is it is it's not biologically accurate and as long as we're saying it is we're kind of not taking the time to understand that that, it, that it's all it's all the clitoris doing all the legwork there so yeah yeah so definitely it seems that some kind of clitoral stimulation is involved with any uh any stimulation of the vulva in general but as as uh, Sarah mentioned, there's people, and I know some people who are like that, able to reach climax from stimulation of the nipples, or even some cases the wind of their on their skin, or thinking about it. And we know from my, what I tell the sales people as sex educators, we know from brain science that orgasm happens in the brain first and foremost. Uh, if there are different parts of your body that get stimulated and allow you to reach an orgasm, and that subjective experience is different for you. And great, you can call them different names, uh, but anybody <laughs> tells you that this is better than that or anything like that, it's just about your own subjective experience and what you like more. Go to Emily Nagoski, pleasure is the measure. Uh, and yeah, don't let, don't let that white man tell you what, what you should do in, in the room. <laughs> uh, I'll get one more question. Um, Dr. Tanaya, how has your reception been? How has your reception been towards your work in advocating for sexual pleasure and clearing misconceptions towards sex on Instagram in India and the broader South Asian region? How was the reaction among women or men? Any differences? Any retaliation? And I'll add to that any marriage proposal. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen the highlights somewhere, but there has been multiple marriage proposals for some strange reason. <laughs> um, no, but I, I do find that there is a very stark difference in the reactions coming from men versus women. From women, it's usually been, oh, thank you for talking about this. I thought I was alone or something along those lines. So this was interesting to learn. Um, I would say about 50% of the response I get from men is usually shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. How dare you, you know, there's this questioning my audacity to talk about these things, uh, situation happening. Um, there's also, culturally, we have so much misinformation in terms of um, any nonsense being attributed to ancient Indian rituals or anything with, where there's absolutely zero mention of, you know, such concepts in ancient Indian practices. For example, semen retention is something that is talked about very often. We don't have that concept, really. If you go back to the books, you won't find it. But um, when I go and debunk this, um, it's usually a lot of you're trying to corrupt India's youth and morality <laughs> and things of that sort. So it is very interesting to see how women are getting more and more um, open and willing to embrace their sexuality and learn more about it, whereas men find it almost threatening sometimes that there's a woman that's coming and talking about it. Sarah, uh, Kate, any word on that as well? Are you in your own work? Um, I get sent a lot of penis pictures. That's that seems to be the reaction to it is is strange. I mean, I'm in I'm in awe of of, of Dr. Tanea there, um, fighting the good fight. And but yeah, it it definitely causes reactions. Is mostly positive, but there's something about being a woman in a public space talking about sex that I don't know. It's it it brings a lot of people um, seem to think that because you speak about sex, it means they want you want to have sex with them. That, that seems to be a strange misconception somewhere or um, I've not been told to, to shut up, um, which is which is um, 
which is good, uh, I suppose. But yeah, is is the sort of the, the constant fetishizing and and yeah, getting off on it, I suppose, is an interesting one that I get a lot. Can I just throw I, in there that um, I've also received vulva pictures aside from. You've also pictures. received vulva. See, I've yeah. I've always wondered if people do those because I've never got one of those and I've just always been curious to, of people out there just without saying hello sending a picture of a vulva that's, I don't know if I'm happy or sad that that's happening but at least I know I, I mean I've certainly been told uh, by by potential publishers that, that they they love the voice of my book but that, that they thought the topic was niche um, which <laughs> I mean, like 50% of the world have one and 40% of the world should or, or wants to be engaging with one. But, but I think, and, and I never know whether that idea that writing, a woman writing and speaking about sex, it, whether that, whether the idea that is niche is because it's threatening and they're wanting to marginalise it or whether because there is, people really believe that there isn't an appetite for more education and more knowledge. And I don't, I don't know which it is. All right, so we're getting close to the end of our time. So as closing remarks from each of you, I'd like to ask, and I'll start with Sarah so you can always already confirm. What would be your hopes and fears for tomorrow's realities around sexual health and sexuality? Oh, for more people like my other panel guests and you kind of advocating and championing it and making it easy to talk about. Uh, and also some uh, more visibility of the research that is emphasizing that actually people who feel accepted, self-sexualized, comfortable in their sexuality actually are people who experience greater well-being and are thriving in the world. And um, I feel I would love for there to be a greater voice and discussion about that. um yeah i suppose it's just keep talking keep researching is um don't be scared of your own body of your own pleasure and uh, yeah let's keep talking because that's the only way that we're going to get get move forward with this isn't it and we need to it's the shame that we need to dismantle I think we live in such a strange world where it's at once like we're saturated with porn and sex everywhere, but then actually an actual discussion about the clitoris is, is niche. It's just, it's completely bonkers, but, but yeah, um, keep fighting the good fight and uh, let's keep the conversation going. Um, universal pleasure and consent inclusive sex ed for everyone. And less shame, less stigma. <laughs> oh, yeah. And if you have a vulva, please, after this panel, find the time at night to take a torch, take a mirror, and see your vulva. We don't do that enough. We all need to see our vulvas. On those words. So thank to all of you for, come, for first, the work you're doing. And I think we're getting a lot of that in the chat. Thank you for your work. Thank you for talking about those topics, uh, it's really, really important as we've extensively covered today. Uh, if you want to learn more about Sarah, her book, Venus of Venus is behind her. Kate's book, A Curious History of Sex, um, is also a great read. And I, re I remind you that she's the creator of Hors of Your online. And finally, Tenaya is Dr. Cuteris on Instagram. I don't think I mentioned the handle at the beginning. Uh, so follow them, uh, read them, and keep talking about it with other people in your life, because uh, that's how we spread that information uh, very slowly. So as closing remark, this event will remain online on view to, to view on demand until the end of November. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, there might be tennis titles uploaded after a few days. This is the fourth day of the 21st edition of the Hong Kong International Literary Festival. You can visit the festival website for details. And there's more than 70 online and live events between now and the 15th of November. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. Thanks very much. And have a great day, night, wherever you are in the world.
Thank you so much.